know, there's talk all over St. Shots of ghost ships. They got some of the worst seas in the world, I suppose, when the wind is up. But worse, there's rocks all over the place that has caused many a shipwreck. I've heard about the ghostly lifeboats with women and children on board that go back and forth from the sea where the harpooner was wrecked to Marine Cove. Sure, whenever you see the light of one of the other boats peering out through the fog when you're out on the fishing grounds, you figure it might be one of those lifeboats, or worse. I figured these stories were just a bunch of old men gone foolish out in the fog, until Jack and I had our own little run-in. It was May 18th, 1968. Me and Jack were making our way back home off the water, and it got pretty foggy. We started to hear the foghorn off the coast of Trapassi, but then we heard another sound. We realized that it was the sound of a boat's whistle, not the foghorn. My son, I will never forget that boat. We aimed toward that whistle. We could hardly see a thing when suddenly this boat appears out of nowhere. The weather was rotten. And we would rather have gone on, but this boat was kind of just drifting along. We couldn't see the name of her, but the couple of people we could see on board looked kind of worried or scared or something. So we figured we should try to help. We climbed up over the rail, but I gotta tell you, old man, there was something wrong with those passengers. It was already like something really bad was happening. There were probably two or three families on board, and they were kind of dressed funny, like from a long time ago. They were staring off into the sea like they didn't know where they were or what was happening. Me and Jack worked our way slowly toward the wheelhouse, where we saw the captain. He was staring off into space too, which really made us scared. First, we asked the captain the name of his boat, but he didn't answer us. Then, we asked him what date he had left port and what he was doing here. Well, son, he looked us right between the eyes, real fierce, and answered us in a very official way. We are in a very urgent situation here, son, he said. We came upon this coast yesterday, May 18th, 1880 but we have been afloat here in these foggy waters ever since. Will you please help us? Holy jumpin's old man, that was almost a hundred years ago. I don't know what Jack was thinking, but all I was thinking was we gotta get off of this boat before we become a part of it. I looked at Jack to go along with me, and then told the captain that we wanted to help him, but to hold tight while we went to get some more help. I think the last thing I heard the captain say was, hurry please, but honestly, I didn't wait to say anything else. Jack and me took off past those people and over that rail as fast as we could. I tell you, neither me nor Jack told anyone about it for a while. But then, some time later, Jack was hearing another guy telling another story about a shipwreck, and Jack told our story. He told me afterward that one of the old men said his father had recovered the wreckage of a steamer right around the same place in St. Shots where we saw the ghost ship. There were no survivors, and they didn't find the name of the boat, but I guess it must have been that one. Ah, there's been so many of them. My name is John Pike, originally from Lancy Bark in Placentia Bay. My father was Walter. He worked hard all his life, made his living from the sea, and lived modestly, raising me and two brothers. One day, while hauling his net, my father found a canvas bag with a number of gold and silver coins. Father told us nothing of this at the time. He hid the money and went down. 
However, before he had a chance to use it, he became ill. Father was fading fast. One evening, as I tended to his bedside, he mentioned that there was money to cover his funeral in the green sea chest at the foot of his bed where he kept his belongings. However, he was so sick, his head was probably so foggy, he never mentioned there was a secret compartment in the chest where it could be found. When my father died, I looked in the chest, but there was hardly any money, certainly not enough for a funeral. Me and my brother covered most of the costs ourselves. We grieved for a while, and then we went on with our lives. Shortly after his death, I moved back into my father's bedroom and slept in the same bed as he had, still with the old chest at the foot. That first night in the room, I woke up to what I thought was a dream. There was my father. He was trying to tell me something, for he kept pointing to the old sea chest. This went on for several nights. Each time he appeared, he looked more and more upset. But my father kept pointing. I realized finally that the chest must have been hiding something. My father directed me to the hidden compartment which contained the gold and silver coins. They didn't look like much at first, but a visit to St. Pierre convinced us otherwise. We managed to cash them in, and after paying for the funeral, we still had money to split between us three brothers. My father, Walter Pike, had always been a good provider, and never once had it said that he left his debts unpaid. Me and my brothers decided that father obviously could not rest in his grave until he was sure that he had completed his tasks, paid for his funeral, and provided for his family and his passing. None of us have seen him since. May he now rest in peace. There may be many reasons why Chance Cove was named such. There is now a provincial park where once the little village Chance Cove flourished on the southern shore of Newfoundland. Pleasant by day, nighttime brings an ominous mood to this place. But there has been many a strange tale told of Chance Cove and the sea that carves its shoreline. It seems the population of Chance Cove mysteriously left over a very short period of time. The vacating of their village was abrupt and unplanned. Left behind were their houses, fishing flakes, and even their boats. Most of the residents settled in New England. None would tell the reasons for their mysterious flight. Rumors persisted, however, that some supernatural terror had hurried their departure. A stranger arrived in Chance Cove one day in the late 1800s. Who he was and from whence he came, no one ever knew. He built a hut in the middle of the village. Out front was a flourishing garden. Surprisingly so, because all others in the village had problems with their gardens. But generally, the fellow got along with everyone in the community. After a number of years, the stranger left the village. No one knew to where, but shortly after he left the village, so too did all the residents. Was this stranger an ambassador for the devil? An evil spirit sent to tempt the residents? Indeed, the people of the village seemed to prosper where times in fact had been tough in Newfoundland. And then suddenly they left. But what or who had they actually left behind? Salvage crews reported seeing a strange figure dancing and playing a musical instrument in the deserted village and on the beach. Shadows were seen to dance around the deserted houses. 
Chan's Cove soon became a place to be avoided. Many years later, two fishermen camping close to the beach were awakened by a scraping on their tent. They opened their tent and saw a young boy, wet, cold, and unable to speak. They followed him to the beach where he disappeared. But on the horizon, the men watched in horror as a ship sank into the dark waters and vanished. Realizing the ship was a phantom, the pair quickly left the beach. The seas of Chance Cove have never fully been at rest either. Over the years, Chance Cove has become a place of many shipwrecks. A large passenger ship known as the City of Philadelphia was lost in the late 1800s. And not much later, the SS Asco. Was one of these ships the phantom seen by the two campers many years later? The angry seas of Chance Cove have claimed many smaller boats as well as these larger ships. Shadows and mysterious figures still seem to haunt what remains of the little village of Chance Cove. Will they ever be at rest? When you can, take a look around this desolate spot, but be warned, don't do it alone. It was 1983. Our band Neon was playing a gig in Bonavista. The owner of the club gave us accommodations in a 200-year-old house. The band and I were to stay there two nights, but we soon found there were other house guests as well. Lunchtime after the first night, I heard someone open the front door, walk in and close it. The footsteps came in and stopped in the kitchen. I got up to see who was there, but there was no one there. Our singer asked what I'd heard. She hadn't heard footsteps, but she heard music. And that started us talking about things we heard the night before. Seems like she heard sounds during the night, like singing and talking. But in her sleepy haze, we were all very tired. She assumed it was a couple of the band members staying up late. However, after the second night's show, some of the musicians went back home to St. John's. They weren't interested in spending another night in Bona Vista. Myself, another band member, and the technician decided, however, to spend the last night in the house. I don't know if we felt brave. I think we didn't want to let on the others that we were too concerned about. But during that night, however, everything seemed to break loose. There were sounds of footsteps on the stairs, banging in other rooms from no known source. The technician agreed with us that it sounded almost like an old-fashioned party going on. It was the sound of a record-playing arm being moved constantly over a record. A very restless night for all. But during the morning over breakfast, no one spoke. All three of us were pretty tired. I don't think anyone actually wanted to be the first to suggest that there was someone else in the house beside us. Well, someone finally said the obvious, however. This is a very noisy house, he said. It is a very noisy house, we agreed, and without saying another word, we finished up quickly and got out of the place as fast as we could. We were just anxious to get home. Well, that's my story, anyway. Escape. 